everyone is well and uh, early wishes for a joyous Thanksgiving, however you spend it and um, the holidays beyond. So welcome to friends of Sarah and her family and Opera Theater, welcome. Other guests, we're always happy to have you join us. Uh, lots of important people, including one I'd like to introduce, a new member of our team, our new director of development, Susie Clark, if you would just say a few words. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Dan. It's so nice to virtually meet all of you. Um, I've heard such amazing things about this group, and I know this is kind of a special program today, but um, I just wanted to pop on and just so you could see my face and know who I am, see my name. Um, I am in week five of my new role, so lots of learning curve, lots of people to get to know, and um, I've had an amazing staff um, of Dan and Amy and Lori and Don and Diane, who have been super supportive um, through my kind of onboarding process. Um, so I really look forward to meeting a lot of you in person when we can do that. But um, just to let you know, if you ever have any questions about anything related to the fundraising aspect of the museum, please reach out to me directly. My email is on the website. Um, and uh, I, I welcome any comments, concerns, questions, praise, anything that you have, um, suggestions, as we sort of move forward with this new, uh, new museum. And I appreciate all of your past support. And, and I just hope to uh, get to know a lot of you soon. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Yeah. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's program. Sarah Sitzer is an active and versatile freelance cellist and entrepreneur in Chicago. She is a member of the Elgin Symphony. Sarah also performs regularly with orchestras and ensembles, including the Milwaukee Symphony and Chicago Opera Theater, among others. Ms. Sitzer is founding artistic director of the Gesher Music Festival in St. Louis, which is how I first heard her perform. And she is founding co-artistic director of Chamber Music on the Fox in Elgin, Illinois. She spends her summers performing and teaching at the Wintergreen Summer Music Festival in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, Sarah holds performance degrees from the University of Wisconsin and Boston University and completed a three-year fellowship with the New World Symphony in Miami under the direction of Michael Tilson Thomas. Today, her presentation is entitled Music of Terezin. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> I am. Um, it's a pleasure to be here virtually with you all. I know many of you, two of you I know rather intimately. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's delightful for me to be here. Um, I, as you can tell from my bio, I am not a historian. Um, I am a musician. And so my my areas of expertise are in music and I take a special interest in um, Jewish classical music and have been interested for a long time in the music that came out of the Holocaust. Um, a particularly fascinating topic because there was so much great um, music and art that came out of such a incredibly dark period. So. I first became interested in this um, because of a particularly inspiring college professor who led a music of the Holocaust class. Um, and she's the one who taught me about many of the composers that I'll be um, talking about today, Pavel Haas and Victor Ullmann and Hans Krasse. 
And I ended up traveling with her um, to St. Petersburg, Russia to learn more about them and to um, teach about them uh, about 10 years ago. And, and so I've been on this journey ever since because the, the resilience that it took to create this music and organize performances during this time is really a testament to the power that art can provide to humanity during our darkest hours. So um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, if I can find, there we go. And whoops, sorry, let me find this for a moment. I opened up the wrong thing. This is always the hardest part. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing. Let me just take one moment to pull it up one more time. Can everybody see this? Okay, great, sorry about that. <laughs> so as we load here, <laughs> there we go, okay. So the first thing, I just wanted to share a little bit of information on Terrazin itself, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, but the town itself is located in North Bohemia, 30 miles northwest of Prague. It was originally built as a holiday resort for Czech nobility. In 18, uh, sorry, 1780, the Emperor Joseph II ordered the erection of the fortress named Theresienstadt after his mother, the Empress Maria Theresa. The city also served as a fortress to protect Prague from invaders to the north. The Austrians used it to strengthen their defense system against the Prussians. During the second half of the 19th century, the fortress was used for the first time as a prison during the First World War, it became a political prison camp and many thousand supporters of Russia were placed by Austro-Hungarian authorities in the fortress. In 1918, with the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the town became a part of the newly formed state of Czechoslovakia. Several decades later, after the Nazis occupied Czechoslovakia, the 7,000 Czechs who lived in the town before the Nazis took over were expelled during June of 1942 to make way for the Jews that they would be transporting in. And just note the on this map on the left, there is a larger northern um, portion of the town and a southern um, portion of the town. There, there is the large fortress and the small fortress. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So after the occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1939, the Nazis originally used Terezin as a military base. But of course, the prison camps began to fill up and the Prague Gestapo police prison was set up in the small fortress, that southern fortress in 1940. Eventually, Germany assigned the Gestapo to adapt the rest of Terezin as a ghetto and a transit camp in 1941. In the town of Terezin, the population had normally been around 5,000 people before the war. Even during wartime, around 11,000 soldiers had been placed there. But of course, at the height of World War II, the ghetto and camp of Terezin held over 55,000 Jews at one time. Now, while the majority of the Jews were sent to the ghetto on the north side of town, 
the prison in the small fortress was used for anyone who tried to escape or was part of the resistance. And this included artists who tried to smuggle out art that depicted the reality of life in the camp. Initially, Terezin was to be used primarily as a ghetto for the elderly. The Nazis deported anyone over 65 who was not fit for a labor camp. Um, also to be transferred were Jewish, German, and Austrian World War I veterans who were either severely disabled due to war wounds or were veterans who were awarded the Iron Cross First Class or above, honored veterans. Later, a third category of Jews was added to the eligibility list for Terezin. Um, prominent Jews, especially artists, musicians, and other cultural figures who the Nazis figured uh, their disappearance in a killing center might provoke inquiry from their communities or from abroad. So in total, from 1941 to 1944, more than 150,000 Jews were sent to Terezin, including 15,000 children. And although it was not an extermination camp, about 33,000 died in the ghetto just due to the appalling conditions arising out of extreme population density, malnutrition, and disease. So we've talked a little bit about the types of people who were sent to Terezin. It was used both as a way station for those being sent to other camps farther east and as a place to house specific populations of Jews, including those decorated war veterans, the elderly, and most notably, these prominent individuals whose disappearance might be widely reported or who would be unfit for forced labor. The inmates included a number of famous poets and musicians, composers, and scholars. Partly for this reason, Terezin had an unusual number of cultural activities for adults and children, and some artwork and music was, that was created there did survive the war, thankfully. We'll be talking today about the music of Terezin, but of course there was so much other art including poetry and art created by music, uh, created by children. Of course, most noti notably um, that which was collected in the book, I Never Saw Another Butterfly. In Terezin, the remarkable musical and theatrical life of Czechoslovakia was permitted defiantly to thrive and great music and was composed and performed by those condemned there. You could hear the symphonic and chamber works of Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, or Janacek, in addition to operas like Carmen or Tosca or The Bartered Bride, which was incredibly popular in Czechoslovakia at that time. The concentration camp had so many musicians that two separate full symphony orchestras could perform at one time, along with various chamber ensembles. Alongside the existence of numerous choirs, cabaret groups, classical and popular orchestras, musical criticism was also written, music instruction was given, and a studio for modern music was created and led by the composer Victor Ullmann. New pieces of music in the most varied styles were composed and premiered in Terezin, and music really it thus became a means of retaining the identities of both the musicians and the listeners. Music simultaneously served to promote survival and signified hope for a better world in the future. The Nazis of course kept a very tight rein on the world's perception of activities in Terezin. And I'm sure you all know this video. We'll watch a couple of clips from it, but in a propaganda effort designed to fool the Western allies, the Nazis exploited the rich cultural life within the camp. Of course, they described the camp as a spa town and retirement community. In 1944, Terezin received what's now become an infamous visit 
from the International Red Cross as ordered by the King of Denmark. The Nazis permitted this visit in order to dispel rumors about the extermination camps. Weeks of preparation preceded the visit. The Nazis ordered prisoners to pave streets, repair a housing, build a playground for the children, as well as fake cafes and shops, and even plant over a thousand rose bushes, just to imply that the Jews lived in re relative comfort. The area was cleaned up and the Nazis deported many Jews to Auschwitz to minimize the appearance of overcrowding in Terezin. As part of the charade, the Nazis compelled the Czech composer and conductor Raphael Schechter to put together a performance of Verdi's Requiem. And we'll talk about this quite a bit a little later. After such a successful experience, using Terezin as a supposed model internment camp during the Red Cross visit, the Nazis decided to make a propaganda film there. It was directed by Jewish prisoner Kurt Geron, who was an experienced director and actor. Shooting took 11 days, starting September 1st, 1944. And after the film was created, um, uh, was completed, most of the cast, as well as Garon, the director, were deported to Auschwitz. Garon perished within a month of his arrival there. So I wanna just show a couple of clips from this propaganda film. The first shows Jews in the ghetto happily gardening, appearing to be completely at leisure. The second, a soccer match that appears similar to a sports game that you would see in contemporary times. It's, uh, it's unnaturally normal looking. And the third is a performance conducted by one of the most important musicians in Terezin, um, Carl Anserl. Seeing the orchestra perform and watching the audience listen, you would never know what they were going through in the camp. So here are just a couple of clips from this film. Diese und die folgenden Aufnahmen stammen aus einem Film, von dem nach über zwei Jahrzehnten ein Fragment gefunden wurde. Er war im August 1944 gedreht worden, um den wahren Charakter der von den NS-Machthabern betriebenen Endlösung der Judenfrage zu verschleiern und zu beweisen, wie gut es den internierten Juden unter deutscher Bewachung ging. Damit sollte vor allem das neutrale Ausland beruhigt werden, indem sich die Wahrheit mehr und mehr zu verbreiten begann. Die Familien gibt es ständig zu jeden und zu jeden, wächst jedoch ein willkommener Zuschuss für den Küchenzettel. Der Originalton des Films ist beschädigt und teilweise schwer verständlich. Der damalige Kommentarsprecher behauptete, die Ernte diene als willkommener Zuschuss für den Küchenzettel. In Wirklichkeit war alles Frischgemüse den SS-Wachmannschaften vorbehalten. Ein Häftling, der auch nur eine einzige Tomate einsteckte, lief Gefahr, wegen Diebstahls von SS-Eigentum vor Gericht gestellt und unter Umständen mit dem Tode bestraft zu werden. Auch dieses Fußballspiel wurde lediglich für die Filmaufnahmen in Szene gesetzt. In einem Schreiben des Regisseurs an die Arbeitszentrale im Ghetto heißt es, Soeben erhalten wir Dispositionen von Seiten der Dienststelle, laut der damit zu rechnen ist, dass morgen, den 1. September, Stadt 1944, Karl Anschall in Prag 1964. Durch seine Konzertreisen mit der tschechischen Philharmonie wurde dieser populäre Prager Dirigent während der letzten Jahre auch in zahlreichen Ländern der westlichen Welt bekannt. Seine Karriere begann schon vor dem Krieg und nach 1950 hat er als Chefdirigent dieses Orchesters etwa 1000 Konzerte gegeben.
Generalmusikdirektor Karl Anschall gab uns ein Interview. A little unsettling watching, watching how normal that all looks, especially in these times when we couldn't even do any of those things. Um, so I want to get to some of the specific characters that made really lasting impression on the cultural life of this camp. The first is Raphael Schechter, who, if you're familiar with uh, the Defiant Requiem, then you know much about already. Um, Schechter was born in Braila, Romania, uh, on the 27th of May, 1905. He went to Prague after the First World War to study piano, composition, and conducting at the Prague Conservatory. After his studies there, he worked in an avant-garde theater and then established a chamber opera company in 1937 that played neglected Baroque music. But of course, Nazi persecution soon forced Schechter to reduce his musical activities to private lessons and home concerts. In November 1941, he arrived in Terezin and soon after began to organize um, singers and instrumentalists. He was a pioneer of cultural life in the ghetto. In the summer of 1942, Schechter began to rehearse Smetna's The Bartered Bride, which as I mentioned was really one of the most popular and famous um, pieces of classical music in Czechoslovakia at the time. The opera premiere took place on November 28th, 1942 in Terezin without sets or costumes and Schechter accompanied the ensemble on a battered baby grand piano. This performance was celebrated as a great musical act and was so successful that it was repeated 35 times. In September of 1943, Schechter was ordered by the SS to conduct Verdi's Requiem. Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi official responsible for eventually orchestrating the final solution, attended this performance and was heard saying, those crazy Jews singing their own Requiem. But many accounts from survivors who were there and who even sang in the choir remember how meaningful it was to be able to sing to the Nazis what they could not say out loud. And so this was actually a remarkable act of defiance. For instance, according to some, the Requiem was kind of like a code to those who performed it. There is an organization called the Defiant Requiem Foundation led by Murray Sidlin, an American conductor. And in an interview, Sidlin talks about how the text of the text of the Requiem describes the end of the world and what happens to those who commit evil. Even as they were facing their own destruction, the Jews in that choir were telling the Nazis how the Third Reich was doomed. After that performance of the Requiem, the initial group that performed was deported to Auschwitz, but Schechter organized additional choirs to go on to perform the Verdi 15 more times. In October 1944, the SS asked Schechter to stage Verdi's Requiem again, this time for the Red Cross visit. It was after this last performance that Schechter was finally transported to Auschwitz and then to three other death camps before he finally died one month before Czechoslovakia was liberated. I wanted to play this little clip of a survivor named Marianka Zadikov, who actually sang in the choir under Schechter. Um, and here, so you can hear some of her insights about what that experience was like. Within the weeks that we were studying the Requiem, Raphael Schechter told us the entire uh, uh, lifetime story of uh, Verdi, and also uh, th that there are many, many other Requiems uh, written by other composers, and he mentioned them. And then he said, I chose this particular the Verdi Requiem, for one reason only, there is loud and clear the 
that are the, come the words. Whatever we do here on earth will be heard and seen. The day will come when you will come before the judge and the judge has the book open and knows everything you did, all the good and the bad things, and you will, you will be treated according to what you did on earth. And, uh, and Raphael Schechter said, we cannot say these things to them, that the day of judgment will come and they will get what they deserve, but we can sing it to them. Many of our enemies, of course, he didn't say it that way. He, I'm saying it now. It is uh, 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 clear that whoever came in a certain uniform belonged to a certain group of people. And uh, among them, uh, while we were uh, uh, singing, actually, uh, 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 we, uh, there was Eichmann. <coughs> I saw him there myself for the first time because a friend of mine who knew what he looked like uh, asked me, to move the temporary curtain we had for a moment before we started singing. Uh, and, and then she said, if you look through this little hole and you make a line, straight line, you will see there are so and so many people in, in, in SS uniform. And in the middle of them is one man who is uh, 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 not wearing a uniform, he wears a certain cap or uh, jacket or whatever, and you will recognize him. That's Eichmann. It's very hard to say uh, 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 what we what, what we felt uh, when, with each transport that left, uh, groups of uh, 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 twenty, fifty, sixty. Uh, 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 19, th there were always people from the Requiem who were very, very important in order to sing it again. So it was never sung anymore after that day in June. Uh, listening to the music may remind many of, uh, of the people in the audience that they have been to theaters and had heard operas uh, like the ones that was now performed in Terezin. Uh, we did our best to sound good, and we did our best to learn our words, whether they were Czech, German, or, um, or, or Latin. But uh, uh, the important part was there was something in that music that was good for everyone, for those who heard it, but also for those who sang it. Mm -hmm. So the next musician I'd like to talk about is Hans Krasse, who was born in Prague in November 1899. His affluent family encouraged and generously supported his musical studies to the extent that his father actually hired instrumental ensembles in order for the young Hans to hear the compositions that he wrote. Krasse studied with Alexander Zemlinsky in Prague a um, prominent composer at the time. And in 1921, even prior to the completion of his studies, he began working as a vocal coach at the New German Opera. He followed his teacher, Zemlinski, to the Berlin Knoll Opera in 1927. And although the support of Zemlinski brought him conducting offers in Paris and Berlin and Chicago, he could not bring himself to accept a foreign post. And he returned to Prague where he enjoyed a leisurely lifestyle, apparently just as inclined to play chess and discuss literature as to engage in musical projects. His bohemian lifestyle inhibited active composition, so his output was small, but the music that he did compose was received with high acclaim. Krasa, of course, did not escape from Prague before German occupation in 1939, and was deported to Terezin in 1942. He was well, most well known by one very important work, Brundibar, an opera written in 1938 to be performed by children. He wrote it as an entry for a children's opera competition and it received its premiere in German occupied Prague by children at a Jewish or orphanage under the baton, of course, of Raphael Schichter. 
Bundipar had one additional performance before the mass transports of Bohemian and Moravian Jews to Terezin began in 1942. In 1943, uh, in July of 1943, the score of Bundipar was smuggled into the camp where it was reorchestrated by Krasa for the various instrumentalists who were available to play at that time. The Terezin premiere took place on September 23rd, 1943. Now, of course, we're re realizing the tremendous propagandistic potential of this very popular artistic endeavor. The Nazis arranged a special new staging of Brundibar for their propaganda film. And the same production was performed for the International Red Cross inspection in September 1944. That would be the last of the 55 performances in the Terezin ghetto. Krasa left for Auschwitz eventually on October 16th, 1944 and perished immediately in the gas chambers. Brundibar was about children and triumphant over an evil ruler. And ironically, the Nazis did not ban this opera like they did other works, only because the libretto was in Czech so the SS guards didn't understand the language and completely missed the metaphor. So here's a very short clip of the children of Terezin performing Brundibar. The next composer is Gideon Klein, born in Prerov, Moravia uh, in December 1919. Gifted from an early age, Klein began piano lessons at age six and by age 11 was regularly traveling from Moravia to Prague for lessons. In the fall of 1938, he began university at the Prague Conservatory, but by March the next year, the Nazis had closed all institutions of higher learning as part of their occupation. Looking to be able to continue his studies somehow, he did secure a scholarship to attend the Royal Conservatory of Music in London. But by that time, Nazi immigration laws prevented uh, Jews from being able to leave the Czech Republic at all. So he was forced to stay in Prague. Klein was able to continue performing under a pseudonym for a while to hide his Jewish roots until even that became too dangerous. And finally, on December 1st, 1941, Klein was arrested and deported to Terezin, where he immediately became an integral part of the camp's cultural life. He formed chamber groups, accompanied large scale performances, including that of the Verdi Requiem, Performing, uh, performed solo recitals, and he blossomed as a composer. As a solo, solo recitalist in Terezin, uh, you could hear him perform Mozart's Adagio, Beethoven's Sonatas, Schumann's fant Fantasy, Brahms's Intermezzi, um, as well as music by Janacek, Joseph Schuch, Schoenberg, Scriabin, and Bach. As with so many of the other Terezin concerts, popular demand dictated repeat performances. And so each individual performance of Gideon's solo and chamber programs were given up to 11 times. 
Klein's compositions in Terezin include chamber music for strings, choral works, madrigals, a piano sonata, incidental music for the theater, and a song cycle. His fellow composer Hans Krasse decided to make a plan for the two of them to save their music. Um, when their own departure was inevitable, they entrusted their manuscripts to Irma Semska, who was Gideon's last girlfriend in the ghetto, instructing them to give, instructing her to give them to Gideon's sister, Eliska, should she survive the war and they meet again. Well, both of these women did survive the war. Irma remained in Terezin until its liberation. And she met Eliska again in Prague after the war and gave her the pre precious manuscripts. Eliska worked tirelessly on behalf of Gideon's music and arranged the first complete concert of his works in June 1946. Thus, this is how we still have all of the music of Gideon Klein and Hans Krasse that was written in, the, in Terezin. Klein was eventually sent to Auschwitz in September 1944, but ended up dying in Furstengrube, a coal mining camp in Poland in January 1945, just two months after his 25th birthday and just as allied forces were beginning to liberate the camps. The final piece that Klein composed in his life was this string trio. He finished it in September 1944, literally just nine days before being sent to Auschwitz. And it was not published until 50, 50 years after its composition. Um, if you happen to attend a performance of the Gesher Music Festival several years ago, you would have heard this trio at the festival. Um, so it's especially meaningful for me to bring it up here. The following is an excerpt of the middle movement which is longer than the combined durations of the energetic outer movements. This amazingly beautiful slow movement is a set of variations on a Moravian folk song called the Nezdeb Tower, a song about a wild goose flying up high into a tower. This symbol of freedom, referencing Klein's own Moravian roots, had strong resonance for the imprisoned Klein and was a link to his idyllic childhood. Using this wistful melody, Klein creates a set of variations, which becomes the emotional heart of the whole trio. Here is just a little bit of that middle movement.
whole piece is fantastic, but that's just a bit of it. <laughs> so Victor Ullman, who I mentioned a while ago, um, was born on January 1st, 1898 in Silesia, uh, although he grew up and was educated in Vienna. Ullman participated in Schoenberg's advanced courses in 1918 and 19, and at Schoenberg's recommendation and became one of Alexander Zemlinsky's conducting assistants <laughs> at the New German Theater in Prague in the 1920s. During the 1927 and 28 season, Ullman became first Kapellmeister at the Municipal Theater in Aussig. In both cities, Ullman enjoyed reputation as an excellent, conscientious, and capable conductor. Following unsuccessful efforts to find work in London or South Africa, Ullman became trapped in Prague after the German invasion in 1939. He was, of course, deported to Terezin in 1942. He was incredibly prolific in Terezin. Ullman had an impressive list of original compositions, three piano sonatas, a string quartet, several dozen songs, orchestral works, and an opera called The Emperor of Atlantis, or Der Kaiser von Atlantis. Ullman also made, upon request, a number of vocal arrangements of Yiddish and Hebrew songs. In addition to his extensive concert reviews, he wrote essays, an opera libretto, and a literary diary called The Strange Passenger, which was a collection of poems and aphorisms. He was soon one of the leading figures at the camp uh, in the musical scene. He was in charge of the program to organize the inmates' leisure, and he was the director of the studio for new music as a critic, a performer, and a composer. Ullman was deported to Auschwitz on October 16, 1944, in one of the last transports where he died in the gas chambers. But before his transport, Ullman was able to give his Terrazin manuscripts to the German philosopher, psychologist, and art theorist, Professor Emil Utit who gave them to the German poet and novelist H.G. Adler after the war. So his manuscripts were also saved from Terezin. The Kaiser of Atlantis was Ullman's most famous work, as still is his most famous work, written at Terezin, a one-act opera that he composed in 1943. In the prologue, the loudspeaker character describes a situation in which the living no longer laugh, the dying no longer die, and life and death have lost their meanings. Death, the character, finding this repulsive goes on strike and no one is allowed to die. The music and the text mirror much of the tension and anxiety which the Terrazin inhabitants felt in the camp. Rehearsals began at in Terrazin in September 1944, but both censorship and increasing transports to Auschwitz prevented a production from ever taking place. The premiere didn't take place until December 1975 uh, at a production led by the Netherlands Opera. It is purported that the Emperor of Atlantis was the reason for Ullman's deportation it was too controversial and he had to be silenced. The work was banned from being performed because Nazi guards suspected that the character of the Kaiser in the opera was written as a satire of Hitler. This clip is a, is a good one to watch because it's actually kind of a trailer for a production by an opera company uh, from several years ago. So you'll see little snippets from different points throughout the opera. But here's a little bit of Der Kaiser von Atlantis.
im Rundfunk. Trommler in den Dörfern. Hier, Oberar, der einzige Schäfer und verdiente Soldaten, ein Geheimmittel zum ewigen Leben. Wer es besitzt, ist gefeit gegen den Tod und keine Wunde und So uh, the last composer I want to talk about is Pavel Haas. Haas was born to a prominent Jewish family in the Moravian capital of Brno in June 1899. By the age of 14, he had already produced his earliest attempts at for formal composition. And at the Brno Conservatory, he studied from 1920 to 1922 with the eminent composer Janacek. During the 30s, Haas thrived in the world of film composition. He wrote several notable scores for both the stage and the film. After the Nazi occupation, performances of, of his works were eventually banned, and he and his wife were forbidden employment, as with all of these other musicians. In 1938, in desperation, he wrote to the relatives of his wife in New Jersey and also to former students of Janacek's. Various attempts were launched by these Americans to help Haas secure passage to the US, but this came too, little, too late um, to help him. Prior to his arrest, he officially divorced his wife in order to protect her and their young daughter. And on December 2nd, 1941, Haas was sent on a transport from Brno to Terezin. Although at first he was too depressed and ill to compose, he returned to some kind of creative productivity when the energetic Gideon Klein put several sheets of blank music paper in front of, her, in front of him and it urged him to return to his work. He later became an incredibly important part of the rich musical life of the camp, writing several works that are considered classics of the time, including The Study for Strings, which was another piece featured in the Nazi propaganda film. You can even see Haas taking a bow in the film. In case you hadn't noticed this trend yet, October 16th, 1944 was the date of transport to Auschwitz for almost every single one of these musicians. Pavel Haas, Gideon Klein, Hans Krasse, and Victor Ullmann, as well as Karl Anserl, the conductor who conducted Haas's study for strings in the propaganda film. They all left for Auschwitz in the same transport on the same day. And according to Anserl, who survived, um, three out of four of the composers, Haas, Ullmann, and Krasa, were sent to the gas chambers immediately upon arrival. Gideon Klein survived that transport, but died later in a death camp in Poland. The study for strings is a piece that survived thanks to the initiative of the conductor, Karl Anserl, 
who performed the work several times in Terezin. Although the scores to the piece were lost, Ansarel ma managed to find the orchestral parts after the war inside the camp. And um, with the exception of one or two parts, which were added later by ha Haas's pupil and biographer, Lubomir Ped Peduzzi. So here's a little excerpt of his study for strings. And this particular video shows um, pictures of Pavel Haas and also of life within the camp. <laughs> Despite desperate conditions, it's telling that not only were the artistic spirits of these composers and musicians not dampened, but their creativity actually thrived. Were they this artistically productive despite their fate or because of it? What's also telling is despite the fact that each of these musicians' musical output ended in 1944, their music plays on to this day even more defiantly than it did in their short lifetimes. And this is due in part to the incredibly important work of several organizations that I wanted to be sure to mess, uh, mention. Um, the first is the Terrazin Music Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in Boston dedicated to amplifying the musical legacy of the artist imprisoned in Terrazin. Um, this foundation performs and records music from Terezin. They produce concerts and events in the US and Europe. They sponsor, premiere, and record new commissions. They teach about Terezin and the Holocaust in schools and houses of worship. 
publish CDs and books and lead tours of Terrazin in Prague. The next is the Defiant Requiem Foundation, which I mentioned a little earlier. This is a nonprofit based in DC and founded by the conductor Murray Sidlin to share and amplify the story of Raphael Schichter and the Terrazin prisoners who used music and art as an act of defiance to maintain their humanity and dignity and hope, particularly in that performance of the Verdi Requiem. Um, this foundation uses uh, performance art, documentary film, and new educational materials to offer a unique approach to addressing contemporary issues of bigotry, human rights violations, mass atrocity, and genocide crimes. And they produced the film, The Defiant Requiem, which if you haven't seen, I would definitely recommend checking out. And lastly, the Oral Foundation, which is a nonprofit founded by James Conlon, whose mission is to encourage interest in and especially the performance of works by composers suppressed as a result of Nazi policies from 1933 to 1945. This foundation encourages the performance of this music by professional and pre-professional musicians. They serve as a resource through their website and through consultations for musicians and organizations. And they raise awareness of the importance of these composers in the history of 20th century music, provide lectures in multimedia programs and seek new ways to bring greater attention to the music lives and influence of composers suppressed by the Nazis. So I wanna finish with just this simple picture, which was created by Bedrick Fritta in 1943 and was given as a birthday gift to Edgar Krasa. Despite the name, he is not directly related to Hans Krasa. Edgar was actually the bunk mate of the conductor Raphael Schechter and was one of the singers in the choir for the Verdi Requiem. Edgar survived the war and immigrated to Boston where he only recently passed away in, in 2017. Edgar and his testimony are featured in the film, The Defiant Requiem. So if you look at this piece of art, two of the most prevalent features are, well, besides the, the violin and the prison barbs, um, are the, uh, I'm sorry, two of the most prevalent features aside from the violin are the prison bars and the barbed wire around the instrument and the music. But what you begin to notice after you look a little bit more closely is the rays of sunlight streaming in through the window. History has never been void of bleak times, but music and art always are those rays of sunshine that help to give us hope for a better future. So thank you very much for having me. And again, I am no historian, but I am a musician and I can speak to some of the music and I'd be happy to um, answer questions or just hear some discussion on this topic. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. Wonderful. Are you familiar with the film Playing for Time with Vanessa Redgrave? And I've, you know your opinion on how authentic it was. I, you know, I haven't seen it. I've heard about it, but I still haven't seen it. Okay. Suggest. <laughs> yes. I'll get Sarah, back could to you expound a little bit on, um, uh, you mentioned that uh, what kind of sparked your interest in this was a teacher that you had in Boston. Can you tell us a little bit more about who that person was and, and that whole journey of yours? Sure. So there's a professor at Boston University whose name is Ludmilla Liebman. Um, she immigrated to Boston from Russia. And this is her area of expertise. She teaches music, teaches classes on music of the Holocaust. And uh, every year, twice a year, well, every year she leads two um, trips, one for Americans to travel to Russia, one for Russians to travel to Boston. 
Um, and uh, it's a cultural exchange trip, but it's also always all based on this topic and leads lectures and concerts and tours around this topic. So after taking several of her classes, I, had, I participated in one of these trips and that's where my initial interest was sparked. And then of course, through the Gesher Music Festival, um, I've done a lot of research into the, the music from this time, um, which is actually easier to present on in this format because I don't have to bring in an entire opera company <laughs> to show you an excerpt of the Kaiser von Atlantis. <laughs> it doesn't just have to be a couple of people, so. Thank you, and your research was impressive. Thank you. I should say, I exposure I've never had before. I'm thrilled, thank you so much. <laughs> Other questions? Dan, I have a question and it may be kind of a silly one with an obvious answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, was there any attempt on the part of the Nazis, either genuine or just for show, to try to, um, you know, square their um, beliefs that, you know, the Jews were lesser than and un unworthy of life with this incredible group of uh, obviously, um, you know, talented, educated, creative, people or did they not even didn't bother who was gonna who was listening i don't know you know i think there was a certain amount of compartmentalization that they acknowledged and recognized this talent and yet because of their their beliefs their ideology pigeonholed these people in a in a different way you know, there's that well-known story of when they had the Kulturbund in Berlin uh, because the musicians could no longer play in the regular symphony. So they formed their own. It became an embarrassment that the Nazis wanted to go to hear them because they were superior musicians. So there are a lot of weird situations like that, that again, they could have these ideas coexist. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. If other questions come up, don't hesitate to send them to me and I will get them to Sarah and uh, get answers. Um, thank you all and uh, wishes for a happy Thanksgiving, however you spend it and um, Take care. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.